Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Cooper Union and to the Great Hall. I'm David Greenstein, the Director of Public Programs, and I'm happy to welcome you to another in our series of lectures on the U.S. Constitution by Professor Bert Newborn of New York University. Tonight's lecture is on the Constitution and criminal procedure. Professor Newborn. Good evening, and thanks again for coming. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm in the constitutional home stretch, and I'm not sure who's more relieved, me or you. Um, uh, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, uh, constitutional criminal procedure, uh, which is the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, um, and Eighth Amendments. Um, and next week, we'll close the lecture series um, uh, with um, the, tenth, uh, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which is just a, um, a particular way of looking at separation of powers and, and federalism. Um, now, cr the formal title of the lecture tonight is Constitutional Criminal Procedure, Madisonian Poetics. Um, criminal procedure is hardly the stuff of poetry. Uh, an, ode, an ode to inadmissible evidence uh, is not likely to crack the bestseller lists. Uh, but Madison's remarkable chronological reconstruction of the criminal justice process in the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments deserves to be read as an integral part of the great poem to ordered liberty uh, that is the Bill of Rights. Uh, as we've seen in earlier lectures, Madison carefully structured the Bill of Rights both vertically, first through the Tenth Amendments, and horizontally in each of the amendments. The six textual ideas horizontally laid out in the First Amendment, the ban on establishing religion, the guarantee of the free exercise of religion, the rights to free speech, free press, freedom of assembly, and the right to petition for redress of grievances, is a careful picture of the ideal robust and tolerant democracy that Madison hoped to found, organized brilliantly horizontally as the half-life of a democratic idea, beginning in the conscience of a free person, passing to articulation through the speech clause, moving to mass dissemination through the press clause, to political organization through the free assembly clause, and culminating in adoption as a law through the petition clause. Now, I've stressed to you uh, in the first couple of lectures that that could not have been random. Um, that order of ideas does not exist in any other rights-bearing document um, in our cultural and social heritage, beginning in the Magna Carta and coming all the way down through the four English bills of rights, the colonial charters, the state constitutions, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was a contemporaneous document to the Bill of Rights. It's unique to the Bill of Rights, it's unique to Madison's organizational genius, and it deserves to be read as a single coherent set of ideas designed to build a picture of a tolerant and functioning ideal democracy. Now, in the Second through Eighth Amendments, Madison lists the dangers to the ideal city on the hill and provides structural antidotes. As we've seen, the Second Amendment responds to the threat posed by an unrepresentative military capable of overthrowing the democracy by assuring everybody who lives in the democracy an equal right to serve in the organs of armed coercion so that the police and the army will look just like the rest of us and therefore not turn on us. The fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, um, um, actually, but we won't have time tonight, and eighth amendments respond to dangers posed by the criminal justice process, by armed policemen. The Second Amendment is armed soldiers. The Fourth through Eighth Amendment are armed policemen. By chronologically surveying the criminal justice process and inserting antidotes to abuse at each stage in the process. And the Ninth and Tenth Amendments close the Bill of Rights by instructing future generations about how the constitutional text should be read in the context of individual rights and government powers. Um, and we'll deal with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments next week. 
this week, the 4th through the 8th. Madison divides the criminal justice process into six phases. If you think about it, this is a brilliant recapitulation of what the criminal justice process is. Investigation, arrest, interrogation, accusation, adjudication, and sentencing. He begins his chronological survey of the criminal justice system in the Fourth Amendment. At the very beginning of the criminal justice process, the investigatory phase, instructing the police about how they are allowed to go about discovering evidence pointing to the guilt of a suspected wrongdoer. Now, most legal systems rely on the professionalism and good sense of the police to limit the reach of their investigatory activities. Madison's Fourth Amendment goes much, much further. And let me read it to you. Um, there was a little red book being given out there. I hope you picked them up. But, but if you don't, let, let, me, let me read the text of the Fourth Amendment to you, and then we'll go through it a little bit. Um, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This is an instruction to the police about how they are to behave when they are engaged in the investigation of a crime. So the Fourth Amendment seeks to insulate the population from unwanted intrusion by the police by one, protecting the right of a free people to be secure from unreasonable government searches and seizures of their persons, homes, papers, and effects without probable cause, and most of the time, wherever possible, requires that the existence of that probable cause be determined by a neutral magistrate on the basis of sworn evidence in the context of an application for a search or arrest warrant that must precisely describe the items to be searched, the items to be seized, and the persons to be seized. So in effect, a search or seizure under the Fourth Amendment becomes unreasonable and therefore unconstitutional if it is carried out without probable cause, which usually must be determined in advance by a judge. Now the major exception is when a crime is being committed in the presence of a police officer. No one would seriously argue uh, that the officer should allow the suspect to escape while the officer goes to a judge and gets an arrest warrant. Under those circumstances, an immediate arrest and a search incident to the arrest may take place without a warrant. And that opens a potential loophole by permitting police to make warrantless arrests and conduct warrantless searches under vague statutes that essentially give them standardless discretion about whether to intrude on a target. I mean, the paradigm of the vague statute used to be the old loitering, statute, uh, loitering laws that existed <coughs> in virtually every state, um, which said that when two or, two or more co uh, persons congregate to create public inconvenience, the police can arrest them. <clears throat> now, that's obviously totally in the eye of the beholder, and it gives the police literal total control of whether they'll stop somebody on the statute, not stop somebody um, under the statute, arrest somebody under the statute. Um, and so the, uh, the loophole is huge. And to close the loophole, the Supreme Court has invented, not in the Fourth Amendment, but in the Due Process Clause of the Fifth, something called the Void for Vagueness Doctrine um, that invalidates a vague standardless statute that vests the police with essentially standardless discretion about who to stop, who to arrest, uh, and who to harass. Um, it's a classic example of the Supreme Court recognizing that the purposes of the Fourth Amendment should not be um, uh, av avoided or evaded by techniques that um, would drain the amendment of much of its meaning. A little later in the talk, when we discuss other techniques that are currently being used by the United States uh, and by states to avoid the Fourth Amendment, I hope you remember the example of the void for vagueness doctrine, uh, that when a loophole opened, the Supreme Court closed it, and they were right in doing so. Um, it's a very short leash designed to prevent arbitrary arrests and searches by the police. Now, we'll, we'll ask a little later exactly what probable cause means. 
Um, and I will confess to you that I don't know, and nobody else does. Um, but we will at least think a little bit about what probable cause means and whether the leash has been unduly lengthened by the Supreme Court's recognition of a number of emergency exceptions to the Fourth Amendment, where no warrants are required under what the Supreme Court calls exigent circumstances, um, and by the court's toleration of significant investig investigatory intrusions, like physical surveillance, undercover agents, electronic surveillance, investigatory street stops, defensive pat-downs, airport security procedures, and random roadblocks that do not, in the Supreme Court's view, rise to the level of a search or seizure and therefore fall outside Fourth Amendment protection. For now, though, it's enough to recognize that under Madison's Fourth Amendment, the police may not initiate an unwanted, substantially intrusive contact with a citizen during the criminal investigative phase without persuading a judge in advance that a good reason called probable cause exists for the intrusion. Madison's chronological survey of the criminal justice system continues in the Fifth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment deals with investigation and arrest. It's the very beginning of the process. They investigate, they figure out who they want, and they take that person into custody. Um, um, the chronological survey continues in the Fifth Amendment, which is what happens after the police have obtained enough evidence under the Fourth Amendment to arrest a prime suspect. And that is the process of formal accusation and interrogation. The horizontal structure of the Fifth Amendment has a slight hiccup. Um, it deals first with formal, formal accusation and only then with the custodial interrogation that usually precedes it. It's one of the rare times where Madison didn't get the chronology perfect. Um, the Fifth Amendment begins with a guarantee that serious criminal charges must be brought not by the police, but by a representative organ of the people called the grand jury. And that a defendant can be formally charged and tried only once for the same crime. We call it double jeopardy. The grand jury provisions were once very important protections of the individual, taking the formal accusation power away from the government, investing it in the people, uh, who had to be convinced that enough evidence existed to hold out a realistic hope of conviction before they would proffer a formal charge against someone. And in the absence of such a protection, an unscrupulous or overly zealous prosecutor could file unwarranted charges that put defendants to massive expense and subjected them to terrible publicity before the charges were dismissed um, and uh, nobody noticed that they were dismissed. And the grand jury was supposed to prevent such an abuse from happening. Now, it's a tribute to the importance of counsel and the public um, um, unfolding of governmental events, publicity, that the grand jury has evolved from what was once a great protection of the people uh, into a tool of the prosecution. Since grand jury proceedings are secret, and since defense lawyers are not permitted to be present in the grand jury chamber, there's never anyone to interfere with the prosecution's presentations of its case on an ex parte basis to the grand jurors. And since the standard for obtaining an indictment merely asks the grand jury whether, whether based on the prosecution's evidence, which may consist almost solely of uncross-examined hearsay and which must be assumed to be true, the only thing a grand juror has to ask is, could a reasonable person believe the defendants are guilty based on this one-sided presentation that I'm hearing from the prosecution? And the truth is, under circumstances like that, a, grand, a good prosecutor can persuade a grand jury to indict the proverbial ham sandwich. Um, uh, um, uh, nothing ever escapes indictment under a grand jury. Um, I, once in my career, I, um, a judge let me actually come into a room and speak to the grand jury. And um, this is purely discretionary. It's virtually never done. Defense counsel never gets to do this. Uh, but back during the um, wounded knee, um, where the Indians were holed up um, in South Dakota at wounded knee, um, a group of students at the University of Colorado wanted to um, aid the Indians in some way. They wanted to, um, and so a convoy of 
automobiles uh, set out from, um, uh, from uh, Boulder uh, to drive to, uh, to Wounded Knee, to South Dakota. And those of you who you know, have a map in your head will re realize that if you're driving that way, you either go through Wyoming or you go through, you go through Nebraska. There are two ways to do it. The kids drove through Wyoming with no, no trauma. A half of the group went through Wyoming, half of the group went to Nebraska. The kids that went through Nebraska got stopped and arrested midway through their trip. Um, and they were, they were arrested because they, the, the pro, I don't know what the United States, States Attorney was thinking, uh, but there is a federal statute that prohibits uh, giving aid and comfort to people who are engaged in rebellion. So his thesis was that the Indians at Wounded Knee were engaged in a rebellion against the United States, and these kids were going there to give them aid and comfort in violation of the statute, punishable by five years in jail. So they, they arrest the 17 kids that get stuck going through um, um, Nebraska instead of Wyoming, um, and um, um, they uh, issue a, a press release saying they're going to charge them with conspiracy for violating the Federal Anti-Riot Act. So I was at the ACLU at the time, so I flew out to Boulder to see what was going on, and I spoke to the kids, and I said, with some trepidation, what did you have in the trunk? What were you bringing them? I, my fear was they were bringing them weapons. Um, I said, what were you bringing them um, in, in, the, in the trunk? And they said, oh, oh, yeah, we, yeah, like, wow, yeah, we were uh, bringing them peanut butter. Um, and the trunk of the cars were full of peanut butter, because peanut butter is nutritious, the Indians needed something to eat, and the kids were bringing them peanut butter. So um, I immediately um, uh, um, uh, called this the great peanut butter conspiracy, um, spoke to the newspapers, the newspapers blew it up. Um, the U.S. attorney got a little nervous. I think at that point he didn't want to go forward. He needed some reason not to go forward. So he said to me, would you like to talk to the grand jurors? And I said, yeah, that would be very nice. I've never been in a grand jury room. I've never seen what a grand juror looks like. Uh, so that would be great. So I went in there and told them the story of the peanut butter uh, conspiracy. I wish I could have sung it like Arlo Guthrie. It would have been great. Um, um, but I told them, the, I told them the, the, the massacre, the great peanut butter massacre. Um, and uh, they didn't indict. They voted what is known as a no bill. They refused to indict. And so the U.S. attorney was able to blame the terrible citizens who were not going to uphold the law. And it wasn't his fault that there was no, that there was no indictment. That's the only time I've ever seen a grand jury not, in, not indict. Most of the time they do. Um, and the modern pro-prosecution role of a grand jury is to provide law enforcement authorities with a means to compel witnesses to give pretrial testimony under oath prosecution witnesses and defense witnesses so they find out what they're going to say, and to produce relevant documents during the investigation phase. It's usually much easier than getting a search warrant and actually interrogating the um, a defendant uh, um, um, even though he has Fifth Amendment rights. So not surprisingly, the grand jury is the only criminal procedure provision of the Bill of Rights that has not been incorporated against the states, the way we talked last week about how the Due Process Clause was used as the bridge to bring the Bill of Rights across to the states. The only criminal procedure right that has not crossed that bridge is the grand jury. And you know what? Who cares? Um, uh, the truth is, um, uh, it no longer is a major defense. Um, the other part of the Fifth Amendment, the, the double jeopardy protection, prevents the state from commencing a prosecution learning a lot during the prosecution, losing the prosecution, and then just doing it again, saying that was just practice. Now we know really how we want to do it. Um, um, you can't try somebody twice for the same offense. Um, and the three most challenging double jeopardy questions that we'll try to answer a little later uh, that have to be answered is, when does the prior proceeding get far enough along that it, quote, puts the defendant in jeopardy? so that to, put, to try them again would be double jeopardy. How far do you have to get? And the short answer is that you have to impanel a jury. You have to start impaneling the jury. That's what kicks in uh, for double jeopardy. Now, you could say it's the beginning of the case. It doesn't have to be that, but that's, what the, Supreme, that's the point the Supreme Court um, imposes. And then what counts as the same offense? And here there's a terrible loophole that we've worked out. The terrible loophole is um, if they call it something else, even though it's the same facts, they can try you a second time as long as the second prosecution takes place in another jurisdiction. Now this emerged out of the perfectly understandable problems that during the civil rights years, people, you couldn't convict people of beating up civil rights demonstrators or murdering civil rights demonstrators. You couldn't convict them in a southern court because you couldn't get a jury 
to issue a, 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 a guilty verdict by, reason, by guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The juries either hung or they acquitted. So you, we were stuck. You knew who the people were. You couldn't convict them. And so the uh, Justice Department in the 60s came up with a very interesting theory, and that is, look, um, so we lose on murder in South Carolina. Now we're going to try them again in the federal court for intentionally depriving somebody of their civil rights. Um, and if death occurs during that uh, point, um, it's a capital offense. So we lost the murder trial in South Carolina. We're now trying the identical facts under a different name in the federal court instead of the South Carolina court. And you know what? That's not double jeopardy, they say. That's not double jeopardy because it's two different jurisdictions and the, and, and the crime is named two different things. Now, of course, you see immediately that I hope you see immediately uh, um, uh, that, uh, that that is double jeopardy, and this is just a huge loophole that they've built. Um, I think they built it because they just didn't trust Southern courts um, uh, to, to actually try to, uh, these cases, but it's opened up a great big loophole. So now New Jersey can try you, um, uh, uh, Florida tries you, Minnesota tries you. They all try you for the same thing, but they put a different label on it, and somehow they've escaped double jeopardy, and that's a problem that we're going to have to fix. And the third one um, is what constitutes a waiver of double jeopardy? And this one is a hard one. This is a tough issue. I don't know what the right answer to this is. The, the existing rule now is that if you are, um, uh, if, if you are convicted um, and you appeal, and the, appeal is, and, the, and the conviction is reversed on appeal, you might start patting yourself on the back and say, I've escaped. They've tried me once. They can't try me again. But the Supreme Court has held that an appeal from a conviction constitutes an implied waiver of double jeopardy. So if you win, in the, in the, if you win on appeal, they can retry you in the lower court. Um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, sometimes I think it's a loophole. Sometimes I think it's a perfectly practical um, um, uh, approach. Um, but uh, the, but uh, the, the question of what constitutes a waiver is still open. So the Fifth Amendment, after it finishes with um, um, double jeopardy, and after it finishes um, with the grand jury, then moves to the next problem. And the next problem is interrogation. Once they've investigated you, once they've arrested you, once they've got you in the station house, once they've formally charged you with a felony, then they're going to start talking to you. Maybe not just even talking to you. They're going to try to persuade you to confess. Uh, and sometimes that persuasion takes very ugly means. Um, so that the Fifth Amendment at that point kicks in and says that no person can be compelled to be a witness against himself in a criminal proceeding. And it's often called the privilege against self-incrimination or the right to remain silent. And you can see why Madison put it exactly where it is. It's where it is because that's where it has to be. That's the point at which the police are zeroing in on somebody, have brought charges against that person, and therefore are, have to be restrained from the natural instinct to try to get him to confess by either tricking him or yelling at him or frightening him or badgering him um, 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 until they finally get him to confess. And that was standard police practice throughout almost all of the 19th and most of the first half of the 20th century. Um, so the, you, you, the, you wonder, though, why the double jeopardy clause, uh, the uh, privilege against self-incrimination is even necessary. Because you would think, from what we talked about last week, due process of law would do the same thing. Um, that you couldn't badger somebody. Um, and the answer, I think, is an important understanding of where the right to remain silent comes from. Um, people usually say it's to prevent torture. But we don't need it to prevent torture. Torture would have been prevented by the Due Process Clause. Um, um, and and in, um, in any setting in which you don't have a Fifth Amendment protection where the police torture, the court immediately says this is a due process violation. Um, so we don't need it. So the question is, what do we need it for? If, if, it's, if it's not to protect against torture, what is it to protect against? And there you get, their history tells us a lot. The real derivation of the privilege against self-incrimination is respect for human dignity and conscience. The idea comes straight out of the Madisonian First Amendment, that no person should be turned involuntarily into the engine of his or, own, uh, his or her own destruction uh, without seriously invading the notion of their personal dignity. The right to remain silent arose historically in response to a form of questioning during, during the European wars of religion in the 16th and 17th century. Suspected heretics were arrested 
uh, and then questioned under oath about their religious beliefs. The practice even had a name, administering the test oath, pursuant to which a suspected heretic was obliged to swear under oath that he or she believed in the true religion. And when the Catholics in, were in power, that was a Protestant that had to swear. When the Protestants were in power, that was a Catholic was, was had, uh, had to swear. Um, when anybody was in power, that's what the Jews had to swear. Um, uh, so the, but, so the, the, but, it was a, but it was a religious oath um, that, was, that was extracted from somebody who was put into custody. For a suspect, think about it for a moment, there's no way out of the test oath. If you refuse to take the oath, you're executed for heresy. If you took the oath falsely, you're damned for all eternity in the eyes of your God. And in an era which genuinely believed in God and genuinely believed in the hereafter, placing somebody in that position was placing them in an impossible position. Recognizing a right to remain silent when the test, test oath was administered to you was the only way out. Um, and as Thomas More learned in A Man for All Seasons, uh, even that was sometimes not enough. Um, but that's where the right to remain silent comes from. And it is, it, its derivation is a derivation in the sense of dignity that doesn't force somebody to either betray their religious beliefs or risk their life. Um, now, once the dignitary nature of the Fifth Amendment is recognized, that it is a, the right to remain silent, that it is a dignitary right, it's easy to see why the Supreme Court has refused to allow corporations to invoke it. A century ago, a smarter Supreme Court ruled that corporations don't have souls and therefore don't deserve Fifth Amendment protection. Now, the court seems to have forgotten that lesson when it comes to unlimited corporate campaign spending in Citizens United. And the really hard question is, why isn't the First Amendment just as dignity-based as the Fifth? when the fifth emerged out of the concerns for religious freedom that animate the first. Um, and that is an unanswered tension in existing free speech law that I predict to you will bring Citizens United down the next time the court has to confront it. Several important decisions, practical decisions, have to be made in applying the Fifth Amendment ban on self-incrimination and we'll go through them a little later, and I'll try to give you a snapshot of what they are. But for now, just let me uh, ask, ask the questions. Should it, should it be read to flatly ban confessions? Are all confessions, after all, a, um, um, uh, um, uh, an incriminating event, even if the confession is voluntary? Um, does it flatly bar the use of confessions? Is a confession ever truly voluntary? As we learn about, in, uh, as people's, uh, we learn more and more about psychology, is a confession ever truly voluntary? Um, if we are to ban only involuntary incriminating statements, how do we decide whether an incriminating statement is voluntary or involuntary, especially where you have a defendant in a station house alone with the police? Um, is any response to a direct query by a policeman under those circumstances ever truly voluntary? Statements elicited by torture or threats are easy, but how about statements elicited by trickery? How about a policeman who is interrogating somebody and says, you better talk because we've picked up an eyewitness who's seen you, and there is no eyewitness. You're just trying to bluff the guy into confessing. Um, 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 how about earnest persuasion? You get a police officer who says, it'll be so much better for you if you, conf if you confess. Uh, first of all, you'll get it off your chest, you'll feel better. And if the policeman really believes this, um, is this appropriate interrogation? Um, how about the promise of a benefit? If you confess, I'll see what I can do to make things go easier for you. Um, when the cop knows that that's not gonna happen. Um, um, so is that, a, is that a violation of the Fifth Amendment? Now in testing for voluntariness, should we distinguish statements made to the police at the station house um, from statements made if they come to your house and want to interrogate you at your house? Um, um, why doesn't it apply? And finally, why, does the, why is the Fifth Amendment under existing law um, a, a, a limited to custodial interrogation? Interrogation where the police have essentially controlled your freedom of movement so you can't, so you can't leave. Why, why shouldn't it apply to all investigations where the state um, uh, targets you and asks you and wants you to incriminate yourself. And finally, and this is a very important practical issue, can the government avoid the privilege against self-incrimination by granting a witness immunity from prosecution? And if so, must the immunity be what we call transactional? So if you 
tell the police something bad that you did, that they can't punish you for the whole transaction that you've described, or can the police limit the immunity to something called use immunity, where they say, okay, we won't use your statement to convict you, but if we can get other independent evidence that you did the thing you said you did, we'll convict you on that other independent evidence, but we swear we won't use the statement to help us get the other independent evidence. Now, can you ever expect a law enforcement agency to live up to that? Um, 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 once they know that you've confessed and once they know that you did it, they're going to use that confession as a way to figure out how to get other independent evidence. So is the line between transactional and use immunity a line that, that, we, can, that we can deal with? Um, I once, well, I'll confess to you, I once beat an innocent plea out of somebody um, uh, in violation of his Fifth Amendment right. Um, I, once, I once defended... A, uh, a, re a remarkable young guy who was a uh, conscientious objector um, uh, in, in the Vietnam War, but he was more than a conscientious objector. He was what was known in those years as a non-cooperator. He believed that the um, mechanics of death, as he called the draft boards and the uh, uh, people that were calling people to fight in Vietnam, were so tremendously immoral that he would have nothing to do with them. So he wouldn't register, he didn't apply for conscientious rejection status, he wouldn't talk to the judge, he wouldn't answer the U.S. attorney. He was a total non-cooperator um, and completely sincere um, in his beliefs. Um, and um, I was walking down the corridor one day at the courthouse, and, one, and the judge said to me, are you free for a couple of hours? And I said, sure. Um, and he said, well, look, I have this kid in front of me um, who won't talk to me, won't talk to anybody. Um, he's a complete non-cooperator. I hate to go for, he won't, he won't allow a lawyer. I hate to go forward with a case that may put him in jail for years um, without thinking that somebody's there listening and um, willing to interject if there's something that the, uh, is going to happen. Well, the young man, he wouldn't retain me. He wouldn't even talk to me. Um, I, was, I was part of the engine of death. Um, um, but I, um, so I listen, and I'm trying very, very hard. Um, I go through all the technicalities. Was the draft notice signed? You know, all the technicalities that sometimes you can get somebody off on. I couldn't do it. Um, um, he, was on a, he was on a straight ticket to um, uh, two years in prison. Um, and then finally, finally, the judge says, he calls me up, he says, isn't there something we can do? This seems like a terrific kid. I don't want to put him in jail. Um, and I said, well, wait a minute. Let's see, let's see what we can do. Um, and so I summon the young man up to the bench, and I say, the judge and I want to talk to you for a minute. Um, um, and uh, he says, yeah, I don't know that I want to talk. But just, you know, we just want to talk to you for a second. Um, what would happen, what do you, uh, what do you think um, uh, would happen um, if you got a draft notice? Would you respond to it? No, I wouldn't respond to it. Um, why not? And then he takes a deep breath and he looks at both of us in the most scathing way. He said, because I refuse to join you two moral cretins as part of the engine of death. The judge says, done. I take that as an application for conscientious objection. The application is granted. The case is dismissed. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> and so what we did is we beat an innocent plea at him uh, in violation of his right to remain silent. Uh, and it was one of the better things I did that month. Um, <laughs> so um, so once, you've been, once you've been investigated under the fourth and charged under the fifth and interrogated under the fifth, then you move to the next phase. And the next phase is adjudication. And adjudication is what the sixth deals with. So you've got this perfect chronology, fourth, fifth, sixth. So the Sixth Amendment deals with chronology. And it begins with a guarantee of a speedy and public jury trial at a place where the offense took place, so they can't take you into some strange area um, and give you a jury trial before people uh, you know, who you have nothing to do with. It has to be in the place where the offense took place, and you're entitled to an impartial jury. We'll talk a little later about how you get an impartial jury and how race and class play in, into uh, the selection of the impartial jury. You have a right to notice of the charges, right to cross-examine the witnesses against you, right to compel witnesses in your defense, and most importantly, a right to counsel. Now, the application of the Sixth Amendment, again, requires the court to decide a lot of hard questions. Um, what does it mean to have a public trial? Who does the public trial protect? Can a defendant demand a closed trial? How, clo how can a closed trial, how can a juvenile delinquency proceeding that often proceeds in private uh, be squared with the right to a public trial? Does a public trial include television cameras? Um, um, can a courtroom ever be closed, even for national security, privacy, 
if, if, uh, if a young woman is testifying about a terrible rape and doesn't want the world to hear about it, um, or criminal enforcement reasons. Can the press ever be excluded? Can the defendant ever be excluded if he becomes obstreperous? Uh, um, these are all questions that have to be answered um, and that the Sixth Amendment doesn't self-answer for us. So we'll have to uh, 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 defer them as, uh, again, and I'll try to give you a snapshot. Um, does the right of confrontation bar all out-of-court testimony? Um, uh, or can some out-of-court testimony come in and not have a, a confrontation clause violation? And finally, and this is the most important, what do we mean by a right to counsel? What if a defendant can't afford a lawyer? Um, what if either a private lawyer or a court-appointed counsel doesn't do an adequate job? When is representation so ineffective that it's like having no lawyer at all? And finally, can the Sixth Amendment right to counsel be imported through the Due Process or Equal Protection Clause to non-criminal proceedings like deportation um, or eviction, um, where huge stakes are involved and poor people often, or mortgage foreclosure, where poor people don't have lawyers? Um, that is one of the great unfinished pieces of business um, in the existing Constitution and the existing criminal and civil procedure aspects of it. So once adjudication of criminal guilt takes place, in the Sixth Amendment, the jury finds you guilty, you then move to the next phase. And the next phase is the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment governs the sentencing phase. Again, perfect chronology. The Eighth Amendment governs the sentencing phase. It forbids excessive bail. It forbids excessive fines. And most importantly, it forbids cruel and unusual punishment. Figuring out what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment confronts the court with some of its most difficult cases. Um, literalism is obviously useless. I don't, know, I don't know what cruel and unusual means, literally. Um, how should a judge, um, um, originalism doesn't work, because by definition, the meaning of cruel and unusual is contingent and changes over time uh, as a culture shifts. Whipping and branding were once acceptable penalties in our culture. Everybody agrees today that that type of corporal punishment would be cruel and unusual. Have we evolved to the point with a death penalty for murder is also cruel and unusual. We came within a whisker of saying so in 1972, and four justices think so today. What about death penalty for rape? What about the death penalty for a juvenile, for an adolescent, for a mental defective? Um, now, before even attempting specific answers to all these questions I've thrown at you, um, I think we have to, we have to um, confront four issues, and then maybe we can take a quick snapshot in answering those things. We have to confront four issues. Um, for, given the, the first one, and maybe the most important, given the meticulous care about the placement of ideas in the Fourth through the Eighth Amendments, it is just impossible to argue plausibly that the Constitution's criminal procedure provisions are randomly ordered or isolated and freestanding textual guarantees that are unrelated to the larger picture um, in which they sit. As with the six ideas in the First Amendment and the two clauses in the Second, the criminal procedure provisions are a tightly organized set of interrelated protections designed to deal with the entire criminal justice process from soup to nuts, and not merely the pieces that happen to fall within the literal wording of a particular provision of the text. In short, there shouldn't be any nook or cranny in the criminal process that is not subject to constitutional regulation just because it happens to fall through a textual crack um, in the language. And to my mind, that means the military trials and the proceedings at Guantanamo, as well as a presidential decision to condemn somebody to death by drone bombing, is governed by the provisions of the Fourth through Eighth Amendment. Now, while the Fourth through Eighth Amendment may not be transferable wholesale, to military and executive national security tribunals, and I don't argue that they are. It'll have to be tailored to the needs of those tribunals. The seamless nature of Madison's poetry means that they just cannot escape constitutional scrutiny because they don't fall within the literal text of the Fourth through Eighth Amendments. At a minimum, the Due Process Clause must apply, carrying with it large doses of the procedural fairness that the Fourth through Eighth Amendments are designed to provide. And by and large, at least with Guantanamo, that's what the Supreme Court seems to be in a very halting way trying to achieve. They haven't even tried it yet with the drone bombings. <laughs>
Uh, that, after all, because all that is, is a con you're condemning somebody to death because he's done something uh, that constitutes what you believe criminal attacks on the United States. Um, that was once clearly the law. It was once clearly the law that the, that the Fourth and Fifth Amendments were seamless protections, that they fit together and that nothing could slip through them. Um, in, in 1886, in a case called Boyd versus the United States, the very first Supreme Court case to interpret the Fifth Amendment, the Supreme Court held that the protection of personal privacy um, um, that is provided by the Fourth and Fifth Amendments applied to any effort by the government to obtain incriminating evidence against a defendant. Boyd was a subpoena case where the government attempted an end run around the Fourth and Fifth Amendments by subpoenaing potentially incriminating documents rather than searching or seizing them under the Fourth or asking the defendant about them under the Fifth. And the Supreme Court prevented the end run. Now, almost a century later, in a case called Fisher versus the United States in 1976, the court changed course. It overruled Boyd and began to parse the text of the Fourth and Fifth Amendment um, as though they were freestanding um, textual entities with no connection with, that, with one another, uh, finding lacunae where the literal meaning of the constitutional text didn't cover the kind of activity that the government was engaged in. In Fisher, the IRS subpoenaed potentially incriminating tax preparation documents from a taxpayer's accountant. The court ruled that the Fifth Amendment didn't apply because it only protects against spoken testimonial compulsion, not the compelled production of voluntarily prepared documents, itself now a huge new loophole in the Fifth Amendment. And that the Fourth Amendment didn't apply, both because the subpoena was not a full-scale search, why it wasn't a seizure at, to, to this day still escapes me, um, and because the documents were in the hands of the third party, the accountant, not the taxpayer. And the court ruled that a search for documents in the hands of a third party does not trigger Fourth Amendment protection because it literally is not a search of the defendant. Um, that's exactly what Boyd had rejected in 1886. Now, Fisher is a roadmap around the privacy protections of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. At a minimum, re recovering Madison's music in the structural harmony of the Fourth through Eighth Amendments would require us to return to Boyd and to the seamless protection of constitutional privacy. Now, once the loophole in Fisher was apparent, the government drove a tank through it. Government investigative and surveillance devices multiplied like oversexed rabbits. For example, the government sent out so-called national security letters requiring telephone companies, banks, and brokerage houses to turn over massive amounts of personal data by their clients to the government on the grounds that there was a national security need for it without informing the subject of the inquiry that the letter had even been sent. Under Fisher, the, the government argued that the letters were not Fourth Amendment searches because they sought materials in the hands of third parties and were not violations of the Fifth Amendment because the disclosure uh, involved voluntarily prepared documents. Thus, argues the government, the disclosures were not forbidden testimonial disclosures. So much for the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. And thus far, despite the heroic efforts of lawyers like Fritz Schwartz over at the Brennan Center, um, the government has gotten away with it. And they've gotten away with it in part because the government has now invented a way to insulate the practice from judicial review by forbidding the third party to tell the target about the letter. So even if your bank wants to tell you about it, it's not allowed to. Um, so that the issue never gets to court. Now, armed with Fisher, the government routinely engages uh, in fishing expeditions, seeking material from targets pursuant to subpoenas, claiming that they're not searches. Such a practice is, to my mind, a patent end run around the Fourth Amendment. Many such subpoenas lack probable cause. None of them involve a judicial determination that probable cause exists. And while there's an occasional decision in validating a subpoena as too broad, courts rarely zero in on the real problem that the subpoenas are disguised searches in violation of the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. Similarly, the government has pushed the envelope on technological surveillance by tapping international phone calls that bounce off a satellite, successfully arguing that intercepting satellite signals is just, isn't really a search. It's just like observing um, a stream of data that's in plain view, like following a suspect. 
And a plane flying over your house taking pictures um, is not a search because they're just taking pictures of things that are in plain view. Um, using heat sensors, on the other hand, uh, other hand is a search, because it goes through the wall. You tell me the difference between those two things. Um, um, attaching GPS tracking devices to somebody's car is a search, but putting a beeper in it is not. Um, it's that kind of incredibly technical um, uh, parsing that they get into when they begin to ask questions about, is this a search or isn't this a search, and not, is this an investigative tool which is really what the Fourth Amendment is about. Another example of the government's in energetic investigatory technique is the use of undercover agents, often placed in mosques and political organizations. The government argues that such a probe into, a group, into, into either a religious or political setting um, is not a search or is not a seizure, and therefore doesn't require any supervision under either the Fourth or Fifth Amendment. Now, what links these aggressive government investigatory tools together is not an objection to their use. Government needs information to do its job. Turning us into Switzerland is clearly not the right direction. Privacy can be a two-edged sword. Taken to extremes, it can shield the activities of powerful entities from desperately needed regulatory scrutiny. I mean, you have only to consider the devastating effect of Swiss bank secrecy on the effort to impose equitable tax programs in small countries all over the world. The rich people in those small countries thumb their nose at the tax programs because they just put their money in a Swiss bank account and are absolutely confident that no one will ever learn about it because the, the Swiss do not permit regulatory um, uh, investigation of what's in the accounts. So the issue is not whether government regulatory scrutiny should be permitted. The real issue, uh, whether the information is needed to protect us from terrorist attacks, pre prevent securities fraud, to fight environmental degradation, or to prevent tax evasion, government has to have a means to get it. The real issue is whether the investigatory activity should take place outside the purview of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. Fourth Amendment probable cause is a flexible concept. Judicial supervision need not hamstring responsible law enforcement. Immunity grants, especially use in derivative immunity grants, remove the self-incrimination danger from the government searches. Merely knowing that judges were looking over their shoulders would, I believe, deter the least defensible intrusions into personal privacy, and it's long past the time that we should recognize that we should move the Fourth and Fifth Amendment into these areas to provide some form of judicial oversight. If we're to be true to Madison's structural genius, we have to overrule Fisher, restore Boyd, and reintroduce seamless Fourth and Fifth Amendment protection. The second um, unanswered question that you have to deal with before you even want to say what the text means is how do we enforce it? Unlike many provisions of the Constitution that have powerful friends to lobby for them, like the institutional press's defense of the First Amendment or the gun lobby's obsession with the Second, criminal procedure amendments are often friendless. When I was national legal director of the ACLU, the first President Bush used to call me the head of the criminal's lobby. Um, uh, while, while large corporations can be counted on to resist regulatory searches, and while we are fond of chanting hymns to praise about personal privacy, the truth is that when criminal procedure amendments are perceived as making it harder to put alleged criminals in jail, they not only lose public support, they invite fierce opposition and contempt from law enforcement personnel who feel betrayed by the rules that they claim make it harder for them to carry out their very difficult responsibilities. And the truth is, if we take a step back, we send our police, our police conflicting signals. On the one hand, we beg them to keep us safe by catching crooks and preventing crime. On the other, we insist that they do it, maybe do the impossible, with one constitutional hand tied behind their backs. Now, the best of our law enforcement officials understand that the dilemma of being a cop in a democracy that prizes individual liberty and freedom from state intrusion makes it a very tough job. But in my experience, an awful lot of police, including high-ranking police, view the constitutional criminal procedure rules as a liberal maze to be circumvented if possible and ignored if necessary. You don't have to see too many Dirty Harry movies 
to realize that such an approach to constitutional criminal procedure is rampant throughout the culture. And I'm sad to say, even in places in the judiciary itself. I sometimes say that the best fiction in the country that I've ever heard is often written in American courtrooms when law enforcement officials make up stories to explain to a judge why they had probable cause to make an arrest in an emergency setting without a warrant. And much too often, the judge winks and buys the story. Um, it was the, uh, um, faced with the difficulty of enforcing constitutional criminal procedure rules, the Supreme Court has experimented with damage actions for violating the criminal procedure rules. Every once in a while, Richard Emery pulls off an occasional miracle by winning such a case, a damage action under the Fourth Amendment. But how many of you would take a damage case on a contingent fee on behalf of somebody whose Fourth Amendment rights were violated by the cops who found lots of cocaine in his apartment during an illegal search? Um, um, I can hear the jury now uh, about how much money and damages they want to award this guy. And uh, sometimes the court pleads with the law enforcement hierarchy to punish cops who cross the line. But more often than not, those cops are treated internally as heroes and not threats to the Constitution. Finally, in desperation, in 1961 in Matthew, Ohio, and then again in 1965 in Miranda versus Arizona, the court went to the nuclear option. In MAP, the court ruled that evidence seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment was inadmissible in any criminal proceeding in a state or a federal court. We call it the exclusionary rule. And in Miranda, the court ruled that involuntary statements to the police were also inadmissible in a criminal case, and they went even further in Miranda by announcing that any custodial statement to a policeman would be deemed involuntary and therefore inadmissible unless the suspect had first been informed of the right to remain silent and his right to a free lawyer. Now, my own experience is that the impact, the combined force of MAP and Miranda, had a dramatic effect on police behavior. So in some sense, it was a brilliant tactical coup by the Supreme Court to go to the exclusionary rule. But it came at a huge cost, which we have to acknowledge. First, public opposition to MAP and Miranda was and continues to be intense. It fueled the law and order political reaction that fostered the political momentum that cost the Democratic Party the presidency in 1968, the Congress soon after, and eventually the Supreme Court itself, the backlash from those opinions. Sustained public opposition to the opinions, coupled with the legitimate question of whether the court had the power to impose the new rules on both state and federal governments, took a toll on the law itself. The incorporation doctrine came under attack but the most important thing um, is, that, is that while the court stood firm on Miranda and opened up some loopholes, um, MAP fared much worse. Over time, based upon the strong public opposition, the court backed down from Miranda. And in, 1960, in 1984, in a case called Leon, they abandoned the absolute exclusionary rule and said that evidence would be excluded only if the policeman acted in bad faith, if he didn't have a good faith belief that what he was doing was lawful. So since there are so many gray areas in the law, that opens up a huge amount of areas where a policeman can say, well, I thought I could do it, even though it's pretty clear that he couldn't. Um, and the evidence then gets used. But the greatest cost of both Mapp and Miranda has been their impact on the Supreme Court's reading of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. The exclusionary rule dramatically raises the stakes of finding that police action violate the Fourth or Fifth Amendment. By opens, opens the prospect that a guilty defendant will go free because the constable bungled. And predictably, the courts have, you could, you could almost do a psychological experiment. As the stakes of finding Fourth and Fifth Amendment violations rose, the su substantive scope of the Fourth and Fifth Amendment shrunk. Um, um, I believe that the courts retreat from Boyd to Fisher and this hyper-technical way of looking at the Fourth and Fifth Amendments um, uh, is a direct reaction against the exclusionary rule because the court is desperately finding now that it doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment because if it says it violates the Fourth Amendment, the, the, the effect is to essentially free the uh, defendant. Um, the same thing with Mapp and Miranda. Um, um, moving of the, the, fifth, the moving in the Fifth Amendment from saying that um, documents with incriminating information are governed by the Fifth Amendment to a narrower notion of it saying only testimonial statements are governed by the Fifth Amendment. 
um, is essentially driven by the fact that you've got to shrink the Fifth Amendment or you're going to lose a lot of evidence in criminal proceedings. Now, I think that's a terrible thing for the court to have done, but it is an understandable psychological thing for the court to have done. And finally, the, what is perhaps the most dramatic impact um, of the court's retreat from the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, the court recognized in 1968 and has repeatedly recognized since um, a category of police intrusion called an investigatory street stop that authorizes the police, despite the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, um, to detain an individual on the street, to seize them and detain them on the street for brief interrogations in the absence of probable cause and without Miranda warnings. Um, um, and in connection with such a street stop, the court authorized the police to engage in a defensive pat-down to make sure the person that they were stopping didn't have a weapon because that would have, would have put the police uh, at physical risk. So they stop without probable cause, they seize without probable cause, they interrogate without Miranda warnings, and they search you to see what, you, to see what you're carrying. Um, now, the court invented a diminished standard out of whole cloth for those stops called articulable suspicion. That the target of a street stop um, will have information for the police. I'm convinced that there never would have been a Terry if it hadn't been for the fact that they were desperately trying to find a way to avoid the consequences of MAP and the exclusionary rule. And in fact, Terry has opened a vast loophole in the Fourth and Fifth Amendments in the ghetto, licensing police to stop young black men at will in the guise of legitimate uh, Terry stop and frisks. In New York City, it is an absolute epidemic. Police defend the practice, sometimes called neighborhood policing, as effective in keeping guns off the street and deterring crime in high crime areas. But the practice creates a two-tier Fourth Amendment. Everybody in this room um, enjoys substantial privacy under the Fourth Amendment. But young black men in the ghetto, for them, the Fourth Amendment simply doesn't exist. Um, and they, you could, a similar problem deals with the Sixth Amendment, right to counsel. We, never, we won't spend the money to really provide real counsel to criminal defendants. Heroic young legal aid lawyers around the country with massive caseloads are doing their best to stay up, but they're overwhelmed and the quality of representation is simply far less than a middle class person would get who could retain even a modestly talented criminal lawyer to say nothing about what the really rich can do in the courts. Um, and we just don't spend the money and there's no way for the court to enforce it. The only way for the court to enforce it is to say it was ineffective assistance of counsel. But that's a very high bar and all you get is a retrial and don't do anything about the systemic problem. Um, so we are now confronted with a situation where we put in Gideon 50 years ago uh, um, tomorrow, uh, next year, the 50th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright that held right to counsel in all criminal cases was 50 years ago. Um, and we're gonna celebrate the anniversary next year in an absolute orgy of self-congratulation about what a fair society we are. Don't you believe it for a minute. There's a facade of right to counsel in these cases, but in the vast bulk of criminal cases, um, individual poor people do not get adequate representation because we just won't pay for it. Um, uh, so we could, we could go through lots of stuff on this. Um, I wanna just end by jumping uh, to the Eighth Amendment because the Eighth Amendment is where a lot of the action is now. It's the death penalty. Uh, cases. Um, what do we do um, with cruel and unusual punishment? How do we decide uh, whether cr cr cruel and unusual punishment bars the death penalty? The court has done two dramatic things under the Eighth Amendment. They've held that even in non-death situations, sentences that are grossly di di disproportionate to the, to the nature of the crime can be cruel and unusual punishment. Life imprisonment for shoplifting. Um, would, be, would be a violation of the Eighth Amendment. But they've, they've made the bar so high that it is virtually impossible um, to, to, um, um, it, with any kind of uh, rational sentence to, be a, to, to make an argument that it is so severe that it violates the Eighth Amendment. Most of the cruel and unusual punishment litigation is over the death penalty. And they've outlawed the death penalty uh, for rape. They've outlawed essentially the death penalty for any crime that doesn't actually take a life. Um, um, the one thing we're good at in this society is eye for an eye. 
Um, uh, so um, uh, if, if, if he didn't take an eye, then we can't take his eye. Um, and so uh, that violates the Eighth Amendment. Um, uh, um, adolescents and juveniles, uh, we can't execute them for crimes that they committed when they were really too young to be um, um, uh, uh, fully responsible for what they've done. Um, uh, we can't execute mental defectives, um, but we have not yet taken the last step and said that the, that the death penalty itself uh, violates cruel and unusual punishment. And you know, the, the last time that I spoke to Justice Brennan was at his 90th birthday when we gave him the Brennan Center um, at the, um, as a gift for his 90th birthday present to say that uh, we're giving you something where you'll always be at the table uh, and your ideas will always be fought for by people who love you uh, and be by people who love your ideas. And he was moved and so we had this nice party for him um, in the Supreme Court chamber and he was in a wheelchair and speaking was not easy for him by then. He was beginning to lose his capacity to communicate but he summoned up his energy and his will for that one last public performance and one last day and he spoke to us. And the last words that Brennan said to us um, uh, were, never give up on capital punishment, never give up on capital punishment, never give up on capital punishment. And then he went silent. Um, and that's the way um, I'd like, you know, I, we have much more. I'll come to your, as I say, I'll come to your homes tonight and finish this. Um, uh, but uh, those of you might want to eat dinner, I have to leave. So um, I would love to give you a snapshot of the existing rules, how they did it. I would love to talk with you a little bit more about um, uh, why we have these rules. Do we care about them because they minimize error? Do we care about them because they maximize human dignity? Or do we care about them because they shrink government down to size so we can fight them on a level playing field? And those, those, are, those are three reasons why you would have procedural criminal justice rules, but they're not the same. And a, a, for example, a, a error minimization judge may be very willing to close his eyes in a case where terrible violations have taken place, but you know the guy's guilty because this is all about dealing with error minimization and there's no risk of error here. A, a, a human dignity guy will say, I don't care that the guy's guilty. Um, everybody has dignity, even a monster who's committed a terrible offense. He has to be treated with dignity. A shrinking of the government guy would say, well, I really worry about this only in situations where there's an overmatch and then where there's no overmatch, I'm not gonna step in. And the truth is we don't have real Supreme Court guidance on that, nor could we, because they're exactly the kind of value choices that I talked to you about in the first lecture. Only a justice's values can tell the justice why you would care about criminal justice proceedings. And it's those values that will give those words real meaning in real context. And they change over time as the justices change over time. The last thing I would have loved to have talked to you about is the impact of race on all of this. My own sense is they gave up too soon. My own sense is that, that, that um, they all relaxed and thought we had gone to a post-racial society much too soon. Um, um, and the Terry stop and frisks in New York City are evidence of that. But that is a, a, a personal view, and it is a value view. So that um, I'll end by, by saying that um, my challenge to you, um, just from hearing an hour, or a little, uh, close to an hour of this, a little bit more, um, uh, an hour of this, um, um, is this, go home tonight. These, these, these books are outside, take them. Read the fourth through the eighth amendment. Ask why they're there. Are you an error minimization person? Are you a gover shriek the government person? Uh, are you a um, um, uh, inherent government dignity person? You can't make sense of this stuff unless you have your own philosophy. And I encourage you uh, as, as, as careful people who care about this to develop your own philosophy, to watch the Supreme Court as it does it. And if you don't like it, do what we did, do what we talked about the first time. You can change the Supreme Court if you change the president and you change the people that populated the court. The most important thing to reform the fourth through the eighth, eighth amendment that has happened in, in my professional lifetime was the re-election of the president in 2012 uh, and hopefully the maintenance of control of who appoints judges through 2016. If that takes place, um, there will be a repopulation of the court with justices who have different values. And Boyd will come back, and Fisher will go away, and we'll have an entirely different criminal justice system. Thank you.
So uh, those of you who are, have a life can leave. Um, um, uh, those of you who don't and want to stay and ask them questions, by all means, the mics are up there and I'll, I'll try to respond. Um, the drone issue and um, Guantanamo pose the power of the government to take military action, foreign policy and all the rest against extension of due process. Now, when I went to law school, uh, the U.S. was proud of the fact that it didn't try to extend its jurisdiction beyond its then three-mile limit, now 12-mile limit. And aren't we, if we do that, aren't we extending our U.S. jurisdiction abroad? Sure. And also, if you can bomb Tripoli and, uh, you know, Jefferson sent the, the, uh, the frigates to to bombard the thing. If we can bomb Serbia, et cetera, what's the difference between that and the drone killings? Okay, uh, well, you, the question is great. The question is, uh, uh, where, do, where do we even get the theoretical power uh, to be able to be doing these things? Um, um, uh, the, the short answer is the, the, the model you choose, the paradigm you choose. Um, when President Bush was in office, he argued that we were under attack, that this was a war. That's why he called it the War on Terror. And therefore, he argued criminal justice rules don't apply here. Military rules apply here. Now, in a military situation, you don't need a warrant to sneak up and try to, over, to break your opponent's code. Um, and, and he doesn't get, and if you capture him, um, he doesn't get a jury trial. He just goes into detention, uh, and you hold him for as long as you want until the military hostilities are over. And so Bush essentially said, I'm a lieutenant colonel on the beach, at, uh, uh, on Omaha Beach at Normandy. And whatever that lieutenant colonel can do, I can do. Inclu including launching attacks, doing all and, and since it's military, um, there's no, there's no um, uh, defense. Um, most of, many people said, wait a minute, um, the difference between that and this is there you were fighting a battle with uniformed people, you knew who they were, there was a time limit, the war would w begin, the war would end, the battlefield was geographically confined, now you're talking about a battlefield that consists of the world, involving people that dress and look just like us in a crisis that will never end in any of our lifetimes. Um, so if that's the case, if that's military, then what you've essentially done is erased any um, 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 constitutional restrictions on what a president can do. And there are people in the Obama administration that believe that as well. Uh, that glorify the ability of the president to act um, because he's the commander in chief and this is a, this is a war. Uh, this is not criminal. And that's when they talk about Tripoli. They say they've attacked us. We're attacking them back. Um, um, my own feeling is that um, it is indefensible to, make, to, create, to create a military paradigm. Um, um, this is much, much closer. To ta um, drones, the reason that drones are different than bombing, bombing, you corporate bomb. You're not aiming at somebody. A drone, you've picked out a guy for death. You have, you have convicted someone in your heart and mind of having done something that warrants death. Um, who, is there any check on that? Is there some CIA guy deciding who it is? Um, now, they uh, um, the Obama administration claims that the president signs off on every single one and spends time agonizing on it, over it. The only problem is that the president gets to see only what they show him. Um, um, and so what kind of protection is that um, if there isn't some formal mechanism for the check? So the answer is the isn't paradigm that, between military and criminal mechanism? is murder. Isn't the formal mechanism for the check the same as it was when we bombed Serbi Serbian airfields or Libyan airfields or uh, the Tripoli bomb, things like that? The, the nature of uh, the enemy now is different, but there are comparisons in the past in terms of, of having these amorphous groups that don't have nationhood, but yet still provide a threat. So don't we have historical antecedents that we can say this is more the same as that than it is some new um, power to kill, license to kill, 007 or something. Well, um, you may know the history better than I do, but um, every example I know of, of where we have moved against um, uh, um, uh, entities have either involved declaration of war or some sort of congressional statement that it was all right to do this, some sort of congressional mobilization of the popular will to engage in this, or giving people absolute due process. When we caught German spies in the United States during the Second World War, we didn't shoot them, we tried them. 
Um, um, and the, 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 the answer is um, to, to simply say it's a war and therefore I can shoot him and there's no, and there's no uh, things, are, things are always different. I've never met an executive official who wanted to avoid the Constitution, who didn't start telling me, oh, of course, in the past, I would have supported the Constitution, but things are different now. Things are always different. There's an epidemic of crime. There's a, terror, uh, um, uh, there's a horrible security crisis. There's always something going on that justifies walking outside the Constitution. Um, and there's a story that scares me that, to have them walk out. I mean, it scares me. I don't, I don't like to think that terrorists are getting ready to blow up the Holland Tunnel. Um, uh, but the question is, do we abandon everything that we stand for as a country in terms of the of constitutional limitations on what the government can do. And the drone bombing is exactly that. The drone bombing is not bombing Libya. Bombing Libya and bombing the airfields are tactical military operations that had collateral damage that took civilian lives. And that's a hard thing and you've got to think about it. But when you target somebody and say, he's the guy I want, and there's no process except the process that the president chooses to give in, in the darkness of his office, I'm afraid of that, and I don't want to go down that road, and I don't think we have to as a people. Uh, hi, Professor. Um, so, given one of that, my best students. <laughs> oh, I was just saying. Um, so, nowadays, 90% of criminal convictions are a result from the plea bargaining process, and we've seen in recent cases the Supreme Court has begun to acknowledge that maybe these amendments and the Sixth Amendment ought to address that process, not just the process of criminal prosecution, but also the process of criminal plea. And I'm curious to know how you see that evolving. And I, I wish, I wish, I, I wish, I, had, I wish, it's a great question. I wish I had time. Um, the, the, the books, the theory books tell us that what we do is we arrest somebody, we interrogate them, we indict them, we, um, um, we put them up and we give them a jury trial. The reality is that nobody has a jury trial. I mean, you walk, walk up and down the corridors of any courthouse in America now, and they're empty. They're empty. Um, uh, there, there are no criminal trials going on. There are no civil trials going on. The judges are in the back working hard, but they're working hard on motions and paper and stuff like that. We don't do jury trials anymore, not many. Um, and the real, the real action goes on in the plea bargaining between the plaintiff and the defendant. Um, and it may well be that what we should be, it's a great question, we should be thinking about whether or not these amendments and the due process clause play a role in the plea bargaining process when the, defendants do, when the defendant has counsel it works pretty well in the federal system because counsel in the federal system is pretty good. But I don't want to think about what a plea bargain looks like in rural Georgia um, uh, for, some, for somebody um, who is tr uh, so who's trying to negotiate a, a plea. Um, he's not going to have adequate counsel. The, the, the negotiations are not going to be adequate. And the only remedy we have now is to set the plea aside because he got ineffective assistance of counsel. You'll get that one in 100,000 times. Somebody will win the lottery and get their conviction overturned that way. The vast bulk of them, no one ever knows about it. No one ever hears about it. Uh, and it's a systemic problem. It could be fixed by better counsel. Better counsel would negotiate better pleas. And then I'd feel, I'd feel a lot better about it.